General Webster, this is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Brian. Can you hear me? You fine back here. Uh, General, thank you for joining us this morning, and, and good morning to the Pentagon Press here. Uh, today, our, our briefer is Major General William Webster, who is the commander of the Multinational Division in Baghdad and commander of the Task Force Baghdad, as well as commander of the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, General Webster and his troops are responsible for the ongoing security operations in and around Baghdad. Uh, he's here today to uh, provide us uh, an operational update in his area of operations. And uh, I think he has a, a few comments that he would like to make to you before we open it up for questions. I just remind you that uh, uh, he can hear you but not see you. So when we go to the questions, if you could identify yourself, that would be helpful to him. With that, uh, General Webster, again, thank you for joining us this morning. This is very helpful for, for us back here, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to take just a couple minutes and uh, mention a few things to you, give you an orientation to, uh, to Task Force Baghdad and the area of operations, the AO that we're responsible for. Uh, first of all, some characteristics of the uh, Baghdad area. It includes not only the urban area of Baghdad, but much of the rural area of the province and beyond. Uh, about 16 to 1,700 square miles of territory, uh, which stretches all the way up in the north to Tarmia in the west, out to the uh, Abu Ghraib prison, uh, down in the south to uh, Salman Pak and uh, Latafia. We have about 440 miles of designated uh, supply routes that we have to secure through Baghdad. As you know, all roads lead through Baghdad. We've got about 1,000 uh, key facilities that includes everything from power plants and, and in one of the country's three oil refineries to, uh, to schools and mosques. There are over 350 mosques in our area. We have the Baghdad International Airport and uh, Camp Liberty, Camp Victory. Uh, the International Zone is in our area, of course. And uh, a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, we were also given uh, responsibility for the outer perimeter of uh, the Abu Ghraib prison. Uh, Baghdad, of course, has the highest population density of any uh, uh, metropolitan area in, ba in Iraq, with about 7 million citizens in our area of operations. Uh, population, as we understand it, is about 62 percent Shia, about 25 percent Sunni, and um, with other segments of Iraqi society rounding out the population. Uh, that's a sort of a quick snapshot of where we work. Let's talk about the task force for just a minute. Uh, it is not all of the 3rd Infantry Division, and we have, uh, we have provided two of our brigades to the 42nd Infantry Division of the New York National Guard. Uh, they work, uh, of course, up around Tikrit, Bakuba. Uh, I've got two of my own ground brigades and uh, three other ground combat brigades of, uh, of the United States Army, with about 30,000 soldiers uh, of the multinational force in uh, Task Force Baghdad. That includes uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and uh, it also includes uh, soldiers from uh, Macedonia, Estonia, and Georgia. So it's a joint and combined force. I also have about 15,000 uh, soldiers from the Iraqi army working for, uh, for me and for us here in Baghdad. And we work with about 11,000 special police and commandos who belong to the uh, Minister of Interior. Our mission, is, rather simply stated, is to secure Baghdad, uh, to neutralize the anti-Iraqi forces uh, and insurgents who are influencing this uh, city and province and to help develop a capable Iraqi security force. Uh, timeline. We arrived over here in January, so we've been here about six months. Uh, we took over from the 1st Cavalry Division here in uh, AO Baghdad on the 27th of February. Uh, since the 27th, we've conducted 11 brigade size operations. And by brigade size, I mean uh, 2,000 troops or so, or more, rather. Uh, most recently, we've conducted a division-sized operation called uh, Lightning. Uh, our part of that, uh, we dubbed Operation Squeeze Play, which began on the 22nd of May. And we folded that in with our Iraqi Army and Iraqi Special Police and Commandos uh, into the Iraqi government's Operation Lightning, 
to help uh, further secure Baghdad. Uh, during those first 11 operations this year, uh, we captured about 1,400 detainees in uh, coalition custody. And uh, since then, since we began Operation uh, Lightning, we've captured another 1,700 or so suspects. Uh, not all of those under our direct control. Some of those were uh, taken by Iraqi um, police and Iraqi army forces. And that includes, uh, in our detainees uh, on the coalition side, 51 uh, foreigners from uh, countries outside of Iraq. Uh, some of the people we've captured lately uh, include uh, foreign fighters from Egypt, Yemen, Syria, and Sudan. Uh, we inherited a situation uh, from the 1st Cavalry Division that was relatively uh, peaceful as compared to the November time frame before the elections and on election day. Uh, attacks were down significantly, but we expected them to come back up with several key uh, events that were occurring in the country. One of those was, of course, the seating of the new government on the 28th of uh, April. And the next day, of course, there was a huge spike in activity with 14 uh, car bombs, or V-bids as we call them, uh, exploding inside Baghdad. Uh, we worked very hard on gathering intelligence as to how these uh, car bombs were put together, what the uh, template looked like that our enemy was using, where he operated, and where the car bombs were exploding, because these were causing uh, dozens of uh, killed and hundreds of wounded in some cases because of the size of them. And we found as much as um, 800 pounds of explosives in some of these uh, car bombs. So we focused our operations in, during lightning on uh, sig significantly reducing the number of car bombs while disrupting the enemy cells uh, that were conducting uh, operations against us and the Iraqi um, government. Uh, we have uh, run more than 2,500 traffic control points since lightning began. It's still ongoing today. Uh, we have conducted over 7,000 patrols and conducted over 500 raids, uh, which, as I stated, uh, has allowed us to capture over 1,700 suspected insurgents and um, 70 caches of, uh, of bomb-making materials, electronics, um, computers, cell phones, explosives, uh, weapons, etc., to include some uh, air defense weapons. And uh, just a couple days ago, a particularly large cache of about 5,000 uh, mortar rounds that we uh, uncovered. We have been successful uh, with the Iraqi security forces in reducing the overall number of attacks in Baghdad, the overall number, meaning all kinds of attacks. Uh, the number of car bombs has been cut in half. Uh, V-bids are down uh, just about 50 percent. And the number that explode, uh, uh, have, have, uh, we've reduced their effectiveness uh, down to about 38 percent of those that explode cause uh, damage or injury. The number of roadside bombs are down, uh, and only 21 percent of the roadside bombs, or IEDs, that explode uh, are causing damage or injuries to, uh, to people. And the number of mortar and rocket attacks are down. So we've significantly disrupted the insurgent cells that were conducting these operations in and around uh, Baghdad. Uh, we made some progress against the insurgency in our area to the degree, to the degree that the uh, resumption of government activities to include drafting the Constitution and the reconstruction of much of Iraq and the economy can continue. We fully realize that the role of Task Force Baghdad here, along with uh, the Iraqi security forces and our, our uh, coalition allies, uh, that we all have a role in, in supporting the development of an Iraqi democratic institution. Uh, there are some more threats ahead. I do believe, however, that uh, that the majority, that the ability of, the, of these insurgents to conduct sustained uh, high intensity operations as they did last year, uh, we've mostly eliminated that. And uh, there will still be some spikes because the enemy gets to choose uh, when and where he conducts some of these attacks. And in fact, some criminals are involved in conducting some of these attacks. But uh, we don't think the, uh, the enemy is capable of sustained long term operations against us and the Iraqi security forces. So with that uh, sort of introduction, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Well, General, thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, update. Uh, 
Charlie, why don't you go ahead and start us? General Charlie Ollinger with Reuters. Uh, just to clear up a couple of numbers, if I could, you said uh, you had 30,000 multinational troops. Uh, those are virtually all Americans, right? And the 15,000 Iraqi troops are in addition to that, not part of it, right? That's correct, Charlie, on both counts. We got about 1,000 soldiers from Georgia, Estonia, and Macedonia as part of the 30,000. And the 15,000 Iraqi soldiers are separate. Um, as, as you and others have said before, the, the, the insurgents keep changing their tactics. Now they seem to be uh, attacking diplomats, as in the, the death of the Egyptian diplomat this week. Um, number one, have, have you found his body? And number two, uh, do you plan to start offering multinational troops to help protect these diplomats in order to keep other countries from withdrawing their, uh, their representatives? Uh, first of all, Charlie, let me clarify on the 15,000 Iraqi soldiers that we have as part of the coalition. Those, uh, those soldiers are in fair, various stages of training and readiness. We've got two Iraqi army brigades now controlling terrain uh, with several thousand soldiers. And uh, the others are in the process of company or battalion or brigade level training uh, so that by the end of the summer uh, there will be an Iraqi division of about uh, 18,000 soldiers uh, by that time that will be controlling terrain in Baghdad. Okay. That's the first point. I just wanted to clarify that those 15,000 are not all fighting every day. Uh, I will say that, that uh, in meetings recently with uh, senior Iraqi leaders, uh, we've been putting together plans for the future and we recognize that uh, all of our forces must uh, be available to help protect our international diplomats who are helping to, uh, to begin relations with this, uh, this new democratic government. And, uh, and so we will be, and we, we have talked about how we can do that together to provide better security for them. Uh, reference the Egyptian diplomat, we have not found his body. And at this point, we don't uh, have any leads, but we are working uh, hard to help the Iraqi uh, security forces uh, uh, determine what happened and where that happened and to get to the bottom of it by capturing or killing those who were responsible. When do you think, just a brief follow-up, when do you think you might begin providing security for the, helping provide security for these diplomats? Uh, Charlie, I'm not sure that in the end it will result in U.S. forces directly guarding some of those diplomats. We've not uh, uh, finalized our plan yet, but um, uh, we certainly recognize we've got to do something very quickly. And uh, the first step, of course, is that this new Iraqi uh, government has, uh, has offered their own police force and special police commandos to, uh, to uh, help guard these diplomats. And, um, it's my understanding that that will begin very soon. I, I, I probably shouldn't talk about when, but uh, very soon. Thank you. Bob? General, uh, this is Bob Burns with Associated Press. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to us this morning. Uh, I was taken by your comment in your opening statement that the uh, insurgent's ability to conduct sustained high-intensity attacks has been mostly eliminated, you said. Uh, that sounds rather a permanent sort of thing, or do you th are they able to regenerate that capability, or have you turned the corner on the insurgency? Yeah, I, I think in an insurgency, it's uh, it's not helpful at all to talk about turning the corner or or um, nearing the end, those kinds of things, because uh, when you're when you're talking about an insurgency in a country like this, uh, that uh, where the borders are still rather porous and folks can still come in and uh, uh, there is money available to hire local criminals and, uh, and others to participate in the fight. It's very difficult to get a day-to-day -day estimate of the number of people you're fighting. Um, and it's very difficult to, to uh, know it's over until uh, the Iraqi people are comfortable with the level of security uh, that they have around them and that they're able to go on with their lives in a normal way. So sort of a... Um, a uh, difficult answer to a difficult uh, question. I don't think um, uh, we can say this is a permanent solution, but I would say in the, in the next couple of months, we will not see uh, sustained, long, bloody months in Baghdad. Thank you. Let's go back to Pam. 
morning, sir. This is Pam Hess with UPI. Could you talk a little bit about the VBIEDs? Um, you said they're down 50 percent. Would you bound those numbers uh, for us from what to what? And to what do you attribute the um, diminishing of their uh, effectiveness? You said only about 38 percent of them explode. Do you have some, some kind of new technological means to, to diffuse them, or do you just have people with less experience building them? Uh, I think you were cut out there in the middle, but I think I got uh, the bulk of your answer, I mean your question. Um, we were uh, experiencing, just prior to, um, uh, to conducting Operation Lightning, we were experiencing uh, uh, 14 to 21 uh, car bombs a week, and uh, we are now down to about 7 to 8 a week. Um, we attribute our success uh, to having uh, better trained and experienced uh, Iraqi security forces uh, patrolling the streets, um, talking to the Iraqi people, gathering greater intelligence. People are gaining more confidence in their security forces here in Baghdad and they're providing them lots of information, which they share with us. And uh, we use that to conduct operations to disrupt these cells and take away some of the key components. Um, we have also become more experienced in um, in finding these things because uh, we know uh, pretty much the, uh, where they're concentrated in terms of their, their production. And, and it isn't a factory kind of thing. These are produced in ones and twos in, in garages and the back end of some shop that has some other meaning altogether, not in very obvious places. Um, but it's, it's both. It's that uh, we've disrupted the cells. They're less, uh, in some cases, they're less capable of making these things well. And in some cases, uh, we're, we have more experience and more intelligence that allows us to get to them before they get out on the street. Can I follow, may I follow up? We've heard, um, and you can't get into details, I'm sure, but has there been some sort of technological solution? We've heard that there are some kinds of sensors out there that are helping in the car bomb problem. Have you seen any of these? Um, we, we have some. I, I'm not sure that they're brand new, high, latest technology solutions because uh, this is a very adaptive enemy, as uh, Charlie talked about a few minutes ago in terms of, uh, or Bob did, in terms of attacking diplomats. Uh, this enemy uh, is able to shift his tactics and uh, share information easily by word of mouth, over cell phone, and, um, and, and over the Internet. Uh, but... Uh, the triggers that are available to cause these to go off um, are, are many and varied. And uh, there isn't a single solution for all of them. Some of them are remotely controlled. Uh, some of them are remotely controlled from inside the car by a driver. Uh, some of them are suicide bombs with a point detonating trigger. In other words, as soon as it touches, hits something, it, it goes off. Others um, are, are uh, um, tied to a timer and uh, driven someplace and left or uh, sometimes go off with the driver still inside, the suicide driver. So it, there are many ways that these things are triggered. And uh, so our ways of getting at them and, uh, and finding them have to be more varied than what the enemy is capable of doing. So it's, a, it's also a very difficult problem. Go ahead, Vince. Yes, General, this is Vince Crawley with the Army Times newspapers. You said you have about 15,000 security forces in the, all of, in the whole of Baghdad, but that you'll be able to, de the Iraqis will be able to deploy a division-sized element of 18,000 by the end of the summer. Yeah. Where will those folks be coming from, and what state of training are they in right now? Uh, let me correct the numbers for you. Uh, we have about 30,000 coalition forces under uh, Task Force Baghdad control, uh, Americans and Europeans. Uh, we have about 15,000 soldiers of the Iraqi army under our control today. They're continuing to train uh, hundreds each week uh, and form new units. And in the end, there will be a, a brigade of about, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a division of six brigades uh, that will have roughly 3,000 soldiers each. So we're still growing and training those units as we go. Now, in addition to that, there are currently about 11,000 uh, Iraqi police, uh, 
special police, that is, not, not the uh, average beat cop, but Iraqi special police and Iraqi special commandos um, who are also conducting operations in Baghdad with us. Uh, if those numbers were further confusing, I'll, I'll be glad to retry. Fine, but what's the time frame for getting the, Ira the six brigades of the Iraqi army online in Baghdad region? Well, we've got six brigade headquarters now. Two of those brigades own battle space. Uh, two more will be gaining battle space in the next, uh, my guess is, uh, my estimate is about 45 to 60 days. The division headquarters is operational and uh, is functioning. And we're training them every day, and uh, the 6th Division commander is, uh, is partnered with me, and, uh, and I've got a full-time team assisting him. So uh, by, the, by the October elections, for sure, we will have uh, five to six of those brigades operational. And just one follow-up, but how many U.S. personnel are assigned to those units assisting them? Um, I think the average is about 45 uh, that, that do day-to-day -day training, 40 to 45. Uh, it varies by unit and their level of expertise and, and experience so far. Uh, that is the level of the Iraqi capability. Uh, but in addition, they've got uh, quick reaction forces of, of American um, platoon to company size that are available to assist them. So, you know, 40 is, is on average in terms of the coaches that they have from day to day uh, and assistance, and another um, 100 as backups, immediate backups, if uh, there are difficulties. Scott Tom. General Tom Bowman with the Baltimore Sun. Back in March, uh, General Abizay told Congress that the Iraqi security forces could take the lead in the insurgency fight sometime in 2005. Uh, two weeks ago, he said, well, the, they may take the lead next spring or next summer. I'm wondering why the delay, first of all. And if you could offer a little more clarity on the Iraqi forces in your own area. Uh, of the 15,000 Iraqi army soldiers, uh, how many are at the top, how many or what percentage roughly are at the top tier of training and readiness? And you also mentioned at the end of the summer, the um, Iraqi division uh, would be ready uh, you said controlling Baghdad. Does that mean taking the lead in Baghdad, or does that mean trained and ready to assist U.S. forces? Uh, last question first. Uh, when uh, our current plan, our current timeline that we're working towards um, is, is to have the Iraqi 6th Division with its six brigades capable of securing Baghdad with the Iraqi police and the Iraqi Special Police and Public Order Brigades. So in other words, Iraqi security forces securing Baghdad for the elections with, with our assistance as backup. And um, we think it's going to take longer. We think it's going to take, I think, I, I, think uh, I, I didn't hear what General Abizaid had to say directly, but I, my, what I would tell you is that I think it's going to be spring of 06 or, uh, or so before they're able to support themselves logistically long term. Um, right now, their difficulties um, are in terms of uh, supporting themselves in sustained operations. Um, supply units and uh, maintenance units. And uh, those are the ones that will take the longest to grow, we believe. And uh, once they've got those and, and their, um, their ministries are capable of supporting them long term, and they'll be able to take control of fighting the counterinsurgency altogether. Uh, our intent with, with the forces in Baghdad is to have them capable of planning uh, security of the uh, election process with our assistance and conducting that security uh, hands-on in the lead uh, by the October and December elections in Baghdad. Uh, I can't speak for the other uh, division areas. And. Um, I will tell you that we measure their readiness uh, not, a, not to the same standards that we measure our U.S. Army units, but in the same general areas. Personnel uh, readiness and manning, uh, equipment training, logistics support, uh, leadership assessments, those kinds of things. Uh, 
and I'll have to leave it there because it wouldn't be useful if I, although I, I could tell you, I, I, I don't want to tell you about uh, the levels of readiness because that would probably provide more information than, uh, than I'd like to give out. You can't give us a rough uh, estimate or percentage of uh, how many are at the top tier? I would tell you that all of them right now uh, require uh, additional logistics support for their long-term operations because that is the long pole in the tent, if you will, the, that will take the longest to develop and produce. Um, there are two brigades that have um, two or three battalions, uh, Iraqi Army battalions working for them, that um, are currently operating out in the battle space uh, now. And the rest are operating at the company or battalion level uh, in battle space that is currently owned by US Army units that work for me. So um, I don't know, what's that, about 35% uh, at this point? I will tell you that you know one of the units that um, uh, one of the brigades that's uh, currently not a what you might call tier one, um, not currently fully occupying battle space in, in their own right, not responsible for it individually. But um, the second battalion of the first uh, Iraqi Army Brigade is the unit that uh, gathered the intelligence, planned and conducted the operation to uh, free the Australian uh, Douglas Wood. And um, the U.S. team of about uh, 10 individuals was supporting them when they conducted that operation. Let's go over here to Al. General Al Pesson from Voice of America. Uh, two questions, sir. Uh, you indicated there's been a uh, reduction in the number and effectiveness of uh, the bombings. And yet last month was, uh, had one of the highest casualty rates for U.S. forces uh, since the end of major combat, and most of those at least it seems from the daily reports, come from uh, some sort of explosion, roadside bomb, or, or vehicle-borne bomb. So can you comment on the uh, apparent discrepancy between those two uh, sets of figures? Uh, first of all, I'm only talking about AO Baghdad and not the rest of, uh, of the country. Uh, there, there are Marine and, and uh, Army and coalition uh, division commanders responsible for those other areas. Uh, but speaking of AO Baghdad, there were, uh, as you know, before, um, before we began operations on the uh, 22nd of May, there were 14 car bombs in a single day. Uh, there was an average of, uh, of 14 to 21 per week uh, just prior to the 22nd of May. And uh, since we began operations, uh, we have cut those uh, car bombs in Baghdad, again, uh, in half uh, to uh, roughly seven or eight per, per week. Well, uh, I might ask, what are you doing that folks elsewhere in the country ought to be doing? Uh, we're conducting operations with our Iraqi security forces. Uh, we had a leg up, I believe, on the rest of the... Uh, of the country's uh, um, coalition forces in terms of having here the, the essence of, uh, of several brigades in the Iraqi army before we started. And uh, so that probably gave us a leg up on the other divisions for conducting operations. Um, other than that, uh, I'd, I'd just say that, uh, that the quality of, uh, of our coalition soldiers and the, the quality of the Iraqi security forces that are developing um, has, has made it so that we were able to gather intelligence and uh, conduct ops to bust up a number of cells that were delivering these car bombs. Well, we, we're, just about at the, we're just about at the end of our time. Let's see if there's anybody else that has a question. Okay, I will let you finish with your third follow-up here. Thank you. Uh, General, the progress that you're reporting sounds like moving toward uh, a military solution, so to speak, and yet we hear from various experts up to and including the Secretary that what's really needed is a political solution. What are your thoughts on the balance between the two, military solution to the insurgency or political, and what needs to be done? Well, I think um, the, the success that we're having, uh, you know, I was talking primarily about the, the military aspect of it, but I will also say that that the Iraqi government is getting stronger all the time. And uh, the, the 
faith of the, uh, the confidence of the Baghdad people in their government in the next year uh, is overwhelmingly high. Uh, so there is a large political aspect um, of, of their confidence. And also, as I move around the city, especially as I'm able to fly from, uh, from neighborhood to neighborhood uh, in moving between our brigades, it's easy to see that uh, th this, this city is prospering compared to what it was a year ago when, uh, when I was last here. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see that there is construction going on all around. The city uh, suburbs are expanding. Uh, there are lots of electrical appliances and lots of, uh, of uh, commerce going on on the streets. And uh, that all shows you that there's hope for the future. And so the economic and uh, political aspects of the solution are strong at work here in this capital city. I might uh, just close here with, uh, with a real good news story. You know, there's been an awful lot of talk about, uh, about our, um, our armor and the level of protection of our um, U.S. and coalition soldiers. Uh, just a few days ago, I, it was on the 2nd of July, we had a patrol from uh, the Louisiana National Guard Brigade, the 256 Brigade, that was out uh, in their up-armored Humvees conducting a routine patrol and a search in one of the neighborhoods looking for uh, some, some uh, IED makers. And uh, while they were out there uh, conducting this patrol off to the side of the road, a sniper engaged uh, one of our, our um, National Guard soldiers, part of this uh, task force, hit him square in the middle of the chest knocked him flat on his butt. Uh, the soldier quickly got up, uh, pointed his weapon uh, towards where the shot had come from, took cover, and then, and then directed uh, the rest of the patrol over towards where the uh, snipers came from. Uh, the rest of his patrol engaged those two snipers, uh, wounding one, capturing both of them. And uh, this soldier who had been shot in the middle of his uh, armor plate uh, is also a medic. And so he ended up, ironically, giving uh, first aid to the soldier who, or correction, the insurgent uh, who had been wounded uh, in, in taking down these two guys who had tried to kill him. So it's a testament to our levels of training, our levels of effectiveness, and the levels of protection that our soldiers uh, from all components uh, are currently getting. And I'd just like to say thanks to all the people responsible for, uh, for providing us uh, such great men and women and such great equipment. Thank you. With that, General, uh, we'll bring this to a close. And again, we want to thank you for taking the time to, to spend it with us and to give us a, uh, a view from the commander's perspective on the ground, uh, one that uh, helps us with uh, our situational awareness back here as we try to tell stories about it. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we hope to have you back in the briefing room sometime soon. I look forward to it, and my thanks to everybody back there for doing their jobs, too. Thank you.